Hey good people and welcome back to my channel. It's Wednesday and you already know what time it is. It's time for a new video featuring how I would have rewritten season 8 of Game of Thrones. This video will specifically cover how I would have changed episode 5 of the last season. And just for clarity, if it were up to me, season 8 would have 10 episodes. So for the purposes of this series, my episode 5 video marks the halfway point for the story that I want to tell. And if you've seen the previous four videos, you will notice that much of the videos focuses on closing the plot holes and producing character development that was either missing or incomplete in the original season 8 of the show. So before we get things started, if you're really feeling this video, then feel free to press that like button. And if you want to support my platform and you haven't done so already, then feel free to hit that subscribe button. My ultimate goal is to get a thousand subscribers before the year is out. So without any further delay, let's begin. Cue the opening credits. The beginning of this episode starts at White Harbor. In this episode, the Knights of the Vale arrive at White Harbor with the children and women from the north. The women and children begin boarding the ships that will be taking them to Dragonstone. As the boarding process continues, it starts to snow and a flock of birds can be seen flying south. An injured father and daughter are seen running towards the Knights at White Harbor. The father tells the knights that he lives near Ramsgate and the dead are headed to White Harbor. A soldier asks the father how far are the dead away and the father replies, an hour, maybe less. Lord Royce is made aware of the situation and he tells the knights to prepare for battle. A soldier reminds Royce about the advice that Bran gave them about not engaging with the dead unless it's absolutely necessary, but Royce ignores the advice dismissing the threat of the White Walkers and bragging about how the Knights of the Vale are the best fighting force in the Seven Kingdoms. They rode down the Boltons of the Battle of the Bastards and they will ride down the dead. Royce's words rally the troops and they leave White Harbor to head northeast just as most of the women and children have already boarded their ships. At this point in the story, the Knights of the Vale didn't have any Valyrian steel or dragonglass weapons to fight the Night King's army and Royce's arrogance will cost him dearly. After about a 30 minute ride, the Knights of the Vale and their forts of over 2,000 mounted knights clash with the White Walkers and the Whites alike. The Knights put up a valiant effort, but they are easily overpowered by a force of 20,000 dead soldiers, comprised of Whites, Giants, and White Walkers throwing ice spears at them. Three fourths of the Knights Vale force, including Royce, are annihilated. The horses that belong to the Knights that fell in battle are automatically reincorporated with the White Walkers. But the Night King's army doesn't bother saving the fallen soldiers for the Night King to resurrect. They immediately begin to dismember the Knights of the Vale and use their body parts to create symbols across the ground that we have seen in earlier seasons. The surviving Knights of the Vale completely abandon their war efforts and retreat back to the Eyrie just as the last of the civilians successfully board the ship set for Dragonstone. The Army of the Dead then completely sack White Harbor and keep a small force there to intercept any incoming ships. A group of White Walkers take a portion of the army towards Moat Caitlin, where the remainder of the army heads northwest with their eyes set on Winterfell. We see a flock of ravens flying over the sky during this time, and we know that Bran has seen everything that has happened in his vision. Back in Winterfell, the War Council meets once again. Bran gets everyone up to speed by sharing that the Knights of the Vale went against his advice and were massacred by the Army of the Dead. The remaining Knights have since deserted the war efforts, and they are on their own. Bran also shares that the White Walkers created another symbol on the ground. Sam shares that in this book, the White Walkers create those symbols for multiple purposes. One is to intimidate their enemies, two, to mark their territory for fellow White Walkers, and three, to help the Night King plan out which areas to send his army to attack. Yes folks, in this version of Game of Thrones, the Night King has his own ravens that he can warg into. And whenever the ravens see these symbols, the Night King immediately knows that an area he is nowhere near has been conquered by White Walkers and is safe for passage. Bran shares that the Night King's entire army is now made up of over 300,000 soldiers. 200,000 members of the army will be approaching Winterfell from the northeast and they'll be staggering into the area within the next few days. There are about 75,000 dead soldiers from the south near Mo Caitlin that are set to arrive in Winterfell a day after the start of the battle and there is a force of 25,000 dead soldiers near Deepwood Moat that will arrive in Winterfell two days after the start of the battle. 
Bran shares that while the Night King wants him dead, Bran's death is not the Night King's endgame. The Night King wants to turn all of Westeros into an endless winter, but won't stop there. He will eventually cross over to Essos after his work is done. The War Council realizes that retreating from the north without encountering the Army of the Dead is now impossible, and they will have to fight. The Council agrees that meeting such a huge force in an open battlefield would be insane, but, but keeping everybody inside Winterfell and trying to fight off countless attacks from an enemy that doesn't tire or feel pain will also end in the loss. This is when Tyrion brings out his battle plans for Winterfell. Tyrion proposes that the Dothraki, led by Ser Jorah, travel south to deal with the Night King's forces there, while the combined Riverland and Night's Watch forces, led by Edmure, head west through the Wolf's Woods to engage the Army of the Dead in a guerrilla-style warfare. Danny and Jon will remain in Winterfell and use their dragons to team up against the Night King. Tyrion also proposes that the remaining forces stay at Winterfell and build three levels of trenches surrounding the area. These trenches would have spike barriers in the front and a maze of barriers in between each level. The hope is that the Army of the Dead will funnel through the singular openings of each trench and be slowed down through the barriers, making it easier for the living to kill them. With luck, the defenses of Winterfell would be able to hold off the Army of the Dead long enough to defeat their forces or long enough for the Dothraki and Edmure's group to come back to help if they're successful in their own respective missions. The majority of the people at the War Council meeting are on board with this plan. Jamie suggests putting catapults behind the walls of Winterfell and only using archers near the castle gates, and everyone agrees with that suggestion. John informs everyone that from his experience, killing a single White Walker also kills every White that the particular White Walker killed. So the ultimate goal should be to target the White Walkers. John also shares that from his experience, the White Walkers tend to be on the outside perimeter of every battle he's fought in. And while the Whites are busy attacking Winterfell, a portion of the army could use the tunnels beneath Winterfell to meet up with the White Walkers outside and take them out. Further along in the meeting, Sam asked the group if they plan to kill the Night King once the army is dissolved. John said that he absolutely plans to kill the Night King himself because the Night King is too dangerous to be kept alive. Sam suggests that after the army of the dead is defeated, that John should just let the Night King be. The group asks Sam why, and Sam says that he read something in the book that the Night King was meant to survive. The group dismisses the advice of Sam and in the War Council meeting. Sir Jorah and the Dothraki, as well as Edmure and the Riverland forces, stock up on weapons and supplies before preparing to head out on their respective missions. Hal and Reed ask to join Edmure in his quest, and Edmure accepts the request. As Edmure and his forces head out west of Winterfell, we see every able-bodied person helping dig trenches and place barriers that will surround Winterfell. Jon decides to get his hands dirty and help out with the barriers, while Danny looks from afar. This catches the attention of the northerners who Danny aims to rule. Tyrion, having had experience defending King's Landing, brainstorms with Bronn, Varys, and Ser Davos on how their army could win the battle with the dead. Varys recalls planning for the Battle of the Blackwater, and suggests how nice it would be to have some wildfire on hand. Tyrion and Sir Davos agree that using fire is one of the best weapons against the dead. The group then comes up with the plan to soak as much of the wooden barriers with oil as possible, so that when they're lit on fire, it makes it extremely hard for the army of the dead to breach the gates of Winterfell. Back in King's Landing, ships carrying the Golden Company's 50 war elephants finally arrive. The Golden Company unloads the elephants and positions them outside the city gates. Kyburn is shown making progress creating his own zombie army and now has tens of thousands of zombie soldiers at Cersei's disposal. Cersei meets the news with approval and then she summons Sir Illyn Payne. Sir Illyn Payne arrives and Cersei makes a comment about how long it's been since she's last seen him. She tasks Sir Illyn Payne with publicly beheading any civilian from Flea Bottom that refuses to join her zombie army. The Golden Company will act as enforcer in this matter. Sir Illyn Payne agrees and does as he commanded. Kyburn also informs Cersei that the King of Dorne has arrived at the capital. Cersei tells Kyburn to show the King to the Red Keep. When the King of Dorne arrives, Cersei comments on how she didn't know Dorne had kings, to which the King replies that the death of Prince Oberyn in King's Landing, as well as the death of the Sand Snakes, caused Dorne to become its own independent kingdom, 
and that he knows Cersei doesn't have the power to fight the Targaryens, the Army of the Dead, and Dorne. Cersei agrees with the king's assessment, and Cersei offers these terms to the Dornish king. If he joins her allegiance and lends his army to her cause, then Dorne would have lands in the Reach and the Stormlands. The Dornish king agrees and begins his voyage back to Dorne to prepare for war. Back in Winterfell, a few days later, Gendry presents the Dothraki with alterations to their weapons. He was able to fuse parts of Dragonglass to their swords so that they would be more effective against killing the Night King soldiers. Danny shares a moment with Ser Jorah, and Danny makes sure Ser Jorah promises to come back victorious. Ser Jorah promises to do the best that he can. The Dothraki and Ser Jorah leave Winterfell and begin their journey down south. Later that night, Jaime and Brienne meet for what they believe will be their final night together. Jaime professes his feelings for Brienne and they consummate their relationship. After the two of them have reached their climax, Jaime vows to protect Brienne with his life. Later on in the episode, Arya and Gendry meet up to discuss the feelings that they have for one another. Arya then happily loses her virginity to Gendry. We then see a scene of Jon and Danny together in bed. Danny asks Jon what has been bothering him for the past few days. Jon replies that he learned that he is the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna. Danny is in complete denial of the news, but Jon informs her that Bran is the one that told him. Danny is still in shock, but she tells Jon that the news shouldn't change anything. Danny then tells Jon her goal is still to sit on the Iron Throne, and she will need his support to accomplish it. Jon isn't too happy with Danny's reaction to news of his lineage, but he reaffirms that he will help her sit on the Iron Throne. Danny ends the conversation by entrusting Jon to keep this news between them a secret, and not to tell anybody else. Jon reluctantly agrees. Now back at Dragonstone, the northern civilians arrive in the area, only to be greeted by Euron's fleet. Madness ensues and Euron tries to attack some of the civilian ships. During this attack, Theon and his men are able to sneak on Euron's ship and a fight breaks out between Theon and Euron. Theon is able to get the better of Euron, kill him, and take control of the Iron Fleet. Theon frees Yara and their reunion happens much like in the original Season 8. The surviving civilians from the north leave their boats and head for the shore of Dragonstone. Theon, Yara, and the rest of the Iron Fleet make camp at Dragonstone for the time being. The episode ends with the White Walker arriving within 10 miles of the gates of Winterfell. Well folks, this concludes my rewrite for episode 5 of the final Game of Thrones season. Thank you for watching my video. If you have any comments or feedback related to this rewrite, let the comment section and I'll be sure to reply to it. And just a heads up. The next episode will feature the highly anticipated battle for Winterfell, and the entire video will cover the actual battle and the aftermath of it. I can also comfortably say that the last five videos of this rewrite series will feature a major battle in each episode. So until next time, stay tuned and stay safe. Peace.